Hey everybody, this is Mike with the One Stop Co-op Shop, and I am so excited to show you this game. We've been talking about it for a while now, but this is our first game that we are publishing. Uh, Peter and I have designed this one, and it's called Flame and Fang. It should be on crowdfunding uh, as of this video airing. And just like I do for our other previews, I'm going to do a full playthrough. I guess I won't give my impressions at the end because clearly uh, <laughs> I'm a little too biased. But yeah, this is a one to four player cooperative adventure game. And uh, let's jump right in. I'll be playing the tutorial first chapter of the game and we'll see how it plays. So in Flame and Fang, each player controls a fledgling dragon whose entire clan has been wiped out. And basically you're trying to fight for survival through an eight chapter campaign and uh, find out what happened to your family, get revenge on the ones who did it, that kind of stuff. Each chapter will have a different configuration of these location tiles. Uh, some will be randomized, some not. And you'll be playing cards. This is a card-based game and also a deck builder to move around, to battle minions in these locations, to gather resources. And those will let you grow and strengthen yourself as a dragon. That's where the deck building comes in. But a key part of the game is that each turn you can only play cards from one of three aspects. So you're not always going to be playing every card from your hand. You have to make some tough choices. And the main timer for the game is an event deck, which is going to have some positive and negative effects in it and also control spawning of enemies. And the narrative of each chapter, as well as the setup, as well as the main events that happen in it, is all controlled by a little chapter deck for each one that you actually open up like a book. And hey, let's jump right in, hear the narrative for chapter one, and see how this little uh, first scenario plays. You awaken darkness, held tightly, trapped. You push and scratch gently at first, then with more strength. Finally, the walls begin to crack. You push out of your eggs, the light blinding you. You are in a cave. Instinct tells you that family members should be there to greet your birth, but there is no one, no mother or father. Your stomach rumbles and you feel cold. You need dragonstone and gold to light your fire and food to fill your bellies. You must explore the outside world and gather what you need to survive. So you can see these story cards that make up each chapter deck are kind of flipped like a book. So each time that you advance the story or that you accomplish the next thing in the chapter, you're going to move on to the next little spread. And here we have the setup. It's telling us that the cave is always on the left. The fortress is always on the right, but all these other tiles are randomized. And also we're supposed to put four of these little books, which are these uh, story tokens that are used differently in each chapter on each player's board. And by the way, I should have said already, all this stuff is very much prototype form. The files for the game are nearly done. We're hoping to go to print pretty soon after the crowdfunding campaign ends. But a lot of the components we had to like actually make ourselves for the prototypes we sent out. Okay, we're also going to spawn some minions based on the player count. So with us playing just a solo game, we're going to spawn a single minion. And yeah, like I said, prototype. Look at the lovely cutting job they did. But <laughs> this is a shaman. He's going to be in Forest 2. Uh, he's got a little uh, spoil, some gold. If we defeat him, he'll drop that. His defense value, how much damage we need to do. And usually his uh, attack value would be here, but the shaman actually attacks in a different way and puts conditions in your deck. Kind of like wounds in Mage Knight or uh, other deck builders, sort of a negative card that gums up your workings. And it also says to add five event cards. The event deck is going to be the main timer for the game. Uh, you lose by running out of time, by running out of event cards at the end of the following turn. Or also if any dragon is uh, fully defeated, loses all of their life cards. Okay, then we flip again. And cards slash pages like this are going to be the most important ones. They actually tell you the mechanical things you need to do. A little bit of flavor text, though. With the bravery that only starvation can kindle, you set forth. So these are the special rules for this part of the chapter. Things will change as we advance, and it will tell us what our goal is and how we advance to the next page. So it says action phase. Each time a dragon defeats a minion, that's one option. Resolves a growth action to gain an upgrade card, the deck building, that's another option, or passes their turn while on the fortress. If you reach the other side of the map, remove one book, one story token from their player board if able. And we've got uh, four of them each to start. And the goal is when no books remain on any player's board, you may flip this card at any time, warning me ready to fight. So we're going to be able to spawn the boss, uh, get to the end of this kind of tutorial-ish chapter by uh, defeating minions, deck building, going to the fortress, uh, any of those will work. And that takes us into our first round. We've got Emerald's player board here, one of the four dragons we can control. And we begin with an action phase where each of the players in turn can take actions. Usually it'll involve each of them playing one card at a time going around the table. So sort of like little micro turns. When we don't want to play any more cards, when we don't want to take any more actions, we can pass. Uh, then we're going to have an enemy activation where minions will attack. Uh, the boss will do something if they're on the board. We'll resolve an event card, maybe spawn some more people. And we'll go back and forth like that until, again, one of the dragons loses all of their life and we lose. Until we run out of event cards and we lose. Or until we move forward in the chapter. 
But before our first turn in each round, we have to pick which aspect we're going to play. So I mentioned this before, but there are three aspects in the game. You've got the blue wing icon, which represents flight. That's an aspect uh, where the cards are focused on moving you around the board. This is the movement action. You've got the red dragon breathing icon here for the fight aspect. That's focused on dealing damage to minions like that shaman waiting in the forest. And finally, you've got the green grasping claw. This is the hunt aspect, and it gives you mostly the gather action, which is going to gain you resources from the board which will be stored on your dragon's horde. Most of the spots for them, three of them, are on your player board itself, but also some cards you can deck build into, and also one of your starting life cards can hold additional resources. So right now I can hold up to four resources. Now some cards will have a star in the corner. As you might be able to guess, those are wild. No matter which aspect you choose for the turn, you'll be able to use those. And the only wild cards you start with in your deck are growth cards. They let you resolve a growth action, which lets you grow into a card from the offer. They're going to cost between one to four resources of any types that you gather with that uh, green gather action. So when you grow, you get to pay for one of those, and it goes immediately into your hand, so if it matches your aspect for the turn, you can use it right away. But also, whenever you grow into a card, you have to trash one of the cards in your hand permanently for the rest of the chapter. So you'll be culling cards as you add them, your deck stays the same basic size, and you get stronger and stronger. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's actually get to the first turn. So at the very beginning of the game, you can do a one-time mulligan where you can discard cards from your hand to try to, you know, ideally get a lot of the same aspect. So I'm going to discard this one fight card and this one flight card. I've already got three of the four uh, hunt actions in my deck. I'm going to hope that I get the other one or maybe my other growth. And wow, I did. Okay, so this is going to be a great turn. <laughs> I can play a ton of cards. So I will, on my first turn, select the hunt aspect which means, uh, barring any special abilities and things, I can only play these four hunt cards and this one growth wild card. I can't play this lunge. I can pretty much ignore that for my uh, hand this turn. And then I would get to play a single card. If I was playing in multiplayer, we'd go to the next player, they'd play a single card. We'd go to the next player, they'd play a single card, and so on, keeping the turns uh, nice and snappy. But here in solo, I'm just going to play as many cards as I want. Now, I talked through the main actions, movement, gathering resources, and attacking enemies. But most cards are going to have one action in the top half of the card, and then a second action that's underneath a little purple banner here. This shows that there is an additional cost to obtain that second action. And these icons here mean that I can either spend a Dragonstone resource. There are three resource types in the game. A meat food can be found in the forest. Dragonstone can be found in the caves and the mountains. And gold can only be found in the civilized places, the outposts and the fortresses. And whenever you take one of these gathering actions, you gain a resource uh, indicated by the location you are on. So like if I gathered in the forest, I would hunt some meat. But again, if I had a Dragonstone to spend, I could spend it to not only gather with this Stalk card, but also move. And when you have multiple actions on a card, you can resolve them in whatever order you want. So I could move and then gather or gather and then move. Now, the alternative is to discard a card from my hand, but importantly, it has to be a card that matches my current aspect. So I couldn't uh, get the second action, the boost on the Stalk, by discarding the Lunge, since that is a different aspect from what I chose for the turn. Instead, if I wanted to like move with the Stalk, I could play the Stalk and discard the Seize, for example. So I'm losing the chance to play that for its gather action, but I'm getting the extra move from Stalking. All right, but I'm explaining a lot. Let's get to my actual turn. So... I'd like to start moving towards that shaman to maybe fight them, since defeating minions will help me uh, advance the story. I'd like to maybe move towards the fortress, and I'd like to gather a lot of resources to uh, grow. All those things are going to help me get stronger and complete the mission. So first I'm going to play a stalk card, and I'll discard a seize to boost it, and that way I'll get both a gather and a move. I'll gather a dragon stone from the cave I'm on, and then I'm going to move into the mountain 2 location. And then I could do the same thing again, uh, use the Stalk to move and gather, but I'd like to have a lot of resources and maybe grow into something this turn. So let's go ahead and play these both to gather twice. So I'm just full of a uh, dragon stone from the mountain here. And all of my player board horde spaces are filled. I can still fit one more on my life. Uh, by the way, the resource tokens are going to be larger. Again, homemade prototype. <laughs> You're going to have some of these uh, little issues here and there. Now, I have a lunge that I can't play because it's not an aspect, but I could grow and gain a card, and heck, if I get a uh, green hunting card, I could play it right away. Let's look at my options. All right, so there's quite a thick deck of upgrade cards, but you only see four of them at a time. They are replaced the second that you get any of them. Right now, I've got a flight card, Soar. It would let me move and draw a card. 
I've got spikes, which is amazing, but costs four and I only have three. Uh, it becomes a life card, so it goes in my life area. And every single turn, regardless of aspect, because once something is in your life area, you don't care about aspect anymore, I can use this to get a free attack action, <laughs> which is kind of wild. Uh, swooping Claws is three. It would let me attack and move. And if I boosted it with a Dragonstone or a discard, I could add any card from my discard pile to my hand. That seems like it'll be better once I uh, grow my powers a little bit more. And then finally, Slash and Go lets me uh, attack, which is pretty nice uh, in the hunting aspect, because usually that's more about gathering resources, and draw a card. So same as a sore, basically. See, I think what I'll do is grow into Swooping Claws. I'll spend all three of my Dragonstone for that. And of course, I had to play my growth to do that. Now, there is a second option on every grow card. It says refresh the upgrade path. That means you can discard as many cards as you like from those uh, four upgrade cards and then redraw if you don't like any of your options. Now, I can't forget when I grow, I have to get rid of a card from my deck for the rest of the chapter. So I'm going to get rid of the lunge. Maybe I'll focus on the green hunting aspect and the red fighting aspect of this game and not uh, try to keep any of my blue cards around. And because I grew, I get to get rid of one of the books on my player board. Remember, uh, defeating minions, ending my turn, uh, passing on the fortress, or growing are all going to let me get rid of these to progress to the next part of the chapter. Okay, then I have a choice. I do have one green card left. I could play it, but not sure I want to attack or move, and I have nothing worthwhile to grab for my discard pile yet. So instead, I'm going to pass. And when you pass, if there are other players, they'll keep going. Uh, usually, they tend to be done pretty quickly as well. But I have two options when I pass. Well, three options, really. I can do nothing. I can just keep the cards I have in my hand. But alternatively, I can discard a single card, regardless of what its aspect is, which is great if, like, you have, I don't know, a bunch of blue flight cards and a single red fight card, and you want to have a better chance of uh, drawing more blue cards on the next turn. But the other option, which is uh, my favorite one to do, is to use your prep area. When you pass, you can put one card that matches your aspect that you chose for the round, in this case, hunting, and prep it over here to the right of your player board. And it stays there as long as you want. Basically, it counts as an extra kind of like bonus card to your hand. It's like I have seven cards in my hand instead of six. But I can keep it there forever. It's one way to call cards from your deck. You can just like put them over in the prep area and forget about them. Or in the case of really good cards like this, it uh, becomes a way for you to have a crazy turn. Like the next time I draw into a bunch of green cards, I can also play my swooping claws and just get really, really cool stuff done. All right, now because I pass, I'm going to discard all of the cards that I played this round. And I'm going to draw back up to a hand of six cards. If I had any cards left, they would stay in my hand. But it just so happens that <laughs> I was able to play every single card that I had. And uh, nice, we're looking at a blue or a red, a flight or fight turn with a single growth as well. But first, we have to get into the enemy activation. First, minions are going to attack if they're in my space, and some of them will resolve special abilities. If the boss is out, they'll do stuff. We'll draw and resolve an event, and we'll do any cleanup steps for the current chapter. So generally speaking, minions are only going to affect you if you're in their location. So if I was in the forest, this uh, shaman would hit me with a spell and I would get a condition. Again, a negative card that gums up my deck. <laughs> that would go to the top of my deck if he attacked me. But since I'm over here in the mountains and he's chilling in the forest and we don't have to worry about that. And the boss has not arrived yet, so there's no boss step to resolve. So all we're going to do is flip the top event card, which again is the timer for the scenario. So we have a little illustration and flavor text. The spirits bring new life to the forest. And this is going to give a positive or negative effect, indicated in this box here, based on the player count. So in this case, with one dragon or three dragons, nothing's going to happen. We're not going to get the free food on forest number four. If we were playing with two or four dragons, we would get that benefit. And then we're checking the spawn for our player counts, and nothing happened from the event, and we are getting a minion. This was a not lovely event card in any way. This time, it is a support minion on the outpost. They'll drop a food if they're defeated. One attack if they're in our space during the minion phase. One defense, so they're pretty easy to defeat. But they can't be defeated if there's a non-support minion at this location. So if anybody else was there, they would kind of hide behind their friends. But this guy's all alone, so he's uh, easy pickings. And the current chapter card has no cleanup steps for the enemies. So we go right back into our next round. All right, so I've got two movement cards. Could move towards either of those enemies. Or I've got some attack cards, but nothing's quite near enough to attack. See, I think what makes the most sense is charging towards some enemies. I want the movement. So even though it's uh, fewer cards, you do sometimes want to pick aspects uh, that are a little bit lighter in your hand. I'm going to pick flight for the round. And first, I'm going to play Rome to move. I'm not going to boost it for the gather action. 
Yeah, forget the shaman. This little guy support hanging out in the outpost. I want to get him before he gets anyone to back him up. And to that end, a little one-two punch. I'm going to lunge at him. And I need to discard something to get the boost and do an attack. And I can only use the growth, which is wild. I can use it as though it's always uh, matching my aspect. I can't use any of these attack cards. So we're not growing. We're just lunging and attacking with the boost discard. So hello and goodbye. <laughs> and he's going to drop a food on the outpost. Now, what does that mean? Whenever you do a gather action on your location, as I said earlier, you get a token matching the place you're on. So in the outpost, I can raid their gold stores. But additionally, if there's any extra resource tokens on a location, which can come from events like I just showed uh, earlier, or which can usually come from defeating enemies, you can take one of those tokens. So if I gathered next round, I would get a two for one deal. I'd get both a gold from the outpost and the one food that was left by the defeated support minion. And I am definitely liking that. And hey, we got rid of another book because we defeated a minion, so if we end our turn on the fortress, grow one more time, we should be uh, in the money pretty soon. So now I'm clearly going to pass because all I got is red cards. I think I know what aspect I'm picking next round. These are gone. I could choose to discard one of these, but that doesn't make much sense. I can't prep anything because none of these are blue. It has to match the aspect I picked this round. So all I'm going to do is draw back up to six cards. And, oh, wow, okay, I'm liking this. We might go uh, hunt on some more minions. <laughs> I got two growth guards, and again, I don't have to use them to grow. I can also use them as wilds to uh, boost my attack cards next turn. We're first getting into the enemy activation. The shaman is very sad to see what happened to his friend, but he's also very far away, so <laughs> he can't do anything about it yet. And I might come over and say hi in a minute. So we're just going to our next event. Benevolent spirits gift you some of their energy. Well, no, they do not. Darn it. <laughs> and I'm adding another minion. Oh, man. All right, this is fine. We got, we got this. So it's a defender, two defense, one attack. Uh, just dropping some food in forest one. That's right next to me. I got lots of targets, lots of options. Now, before I go into round three, I haven't gotten hurt yet, but I should probably explain how it works. So uh, something I think is pretty neat that we did with uh, the game is that when you get hurt, you have these life cards that start in your life area here, and they go to your discard pile, just like any other card. They're going to get shuffled back into your deck, just like any other card, and they are played just like any other card. That's how you heal. So if this life card was in my hand and I picked the flight, the blue aspect, I could play it and I've healed myself. Now I have four life again. And uh, that's one reason why one of your life cards is a wild. It seems like it would always make sense to hurt that one first because it's the easiest to play back. It's the easiest to heal from. But it also has the extra horde space to hold a fourth resource. So you get kind of a tough choice of whether you want to make your healing easier and faster or whether you want to uh, hurt yourself with one of the other life cards and try to uh, keep some more resource space for yourself. Right, but anyway, we know what we're doing, right? We're, we're, we're angry. We're hungry. We're <laughs> hungry for action. Uh, we want to fight. But who do we want to fight, the Defender or the Shaman? I definitely want to gather the free food on the outpost before I go anywhere. But then I also want to move. Hmm. All right, so let's see, let's see. So <laughs> this is not efficient. I'm going to play a Bite card. I don't have anyone to attack on my space. You can only attack in the same space as yourself, unless, well, there are lots of, like, flame-breathing cards and stuff that you can upgrade into. But right now, I can only attack in my space. So I'm going to play this. There we go. Totally ignore the attack aspect and instead discard this bite just to boost into the gather down here, which, as I mentioned before, will get me the food that the other enemy left and the gold from the outpost itself. Now, you might be wondering, why do you have food and gold and dragonstone if they're all used the same for uh, growing and for getting new cards? And you're right, but there is something else going on with them. Each of them has a different resource ability they can be used for. You can spend food to draw a single card. Now, depending on what's in your discard pile, you won't know whether it'll be useful for your aspect or not. So that's a little bit more of a uh, gamble. As I already mentioned earlier, you can use Dragonstone to boost cards, activate their bottom action. But the really fun one that I think I'm going to use right now with the gold I just picked up, oh, sorry, let's put my food back, is the Convert ability, which lets you break the rule for a single card of playing within aspect. And psych, this lunge is now a uh, red card for this turn. I can play that. So let's move and maybe boost into an attack. I like the sound of that. Yeah, let's, uh, hmm. let's discard a growth as a wild. So again, I can only play this lunge because I use the gold to convert its aspect for the turn. Uh, so I'm moving and I'm discarding the growth to also get an attack action out of it. So hey there, Defender. 
And you do have a little uh, damage tokens here. Uh, again, all the sizing is not final, but uh, once I get to two of these on the defender, he'll be defeated. Which, let's not uh, waste time, is going to happen really quickly. So we'll swoop in for the kill. Uh, he will drop a food there, which also gets rid of my third token. One more, and uh, some bosses are going to come to play, and I don't think I've grown enough yet to handle them. And all I've got left in my hand is growth, which means I can't actually grow because I would have to throw away a card. Well, unless I threw away the swooping claws, because since it's in my prep area, it counts as in my hand. I don't want to get rid of that card. <laughs> so I'm going to pass and prep this as well. You can have as many cards in your prep area as you want. And yeah, really setting up for some awesomeness in the future, I think. All right, although I do have to get things going. Um, I only got, I think, a couple event cards left. Wait, did I do my entire hand again? <laughs> yeah, this is going well. So six more cards. And ooh, ooh, oh my gosh. With the green card waiting in my prep area and the wild. This is going to be a good turn, y'all. But first, we have to uh, check another event. A new vein of Dragonstone has been discovered. Ooh, this one is for us. We get to place a Dragonstone on Mountain 1, which is a little bit out of our way. I don't know if we'll ever go get it. And then we're spawning another minion. Uh, and this time it's a warden who actually has a special ability. Besides having three defense, they remove all damage at the end of uh, every round. So you have to defeat them in one shot. And oh look, uh, they happen to be on the same mountain the free dragonstone came in. So I guess uh, we know who mined that up, don't we? All right, so this turn I can get a ton of resources. And I can grow. I kind of want the spikes, right? I mean, a fifth life and a free damage every round, regardless of aspect? That's absurd. I mean, the four cost cards are ridiculous. That's kind of uh, by design. So yeah, yeah, let's let's go with uh, the hunt aspect. And I don't need all of these. I mean, geez. Uh, let's do stalk. I'm going to gather. And then I do want to, I don't know, I guess this card. I do want to move. Back to the outpost, I'd love to be able to convert some more cards and just get more playing going on. So I'll gather um, the free food from the defeated guy and the other food here. Gets me up to three resources. Then I'm gonna just play this one to gather. Hello, hello, give me your gold. And yeah, one, two, three, four, I am fully stocked up. Let's, uh, let's grow. So I'll play the growth from my prep area. This mine's is definitely the way to go here, right? Oh, I didn't look at the uh, new one, scout ahead. It's a move. Ooh, and if you boost, you can play a red card and or a green card, even though blue is your aspect. So that's it's pretty nice. But no, I, I definitely want the spikes. I mean, it's just too good. So that costs everything. And I have to get rid of, well, this is an obvious choice. So which card I'm going to get rid of my head? I already trashed one blue card. Let's trash another. I'm going to try to never uh, call the blue aspect if I can help it. And then, all right, I'm left in an interesting situation. <laughs> Where I have one green card left. Oh, no, actually, I have two green cards left because I could still do swooping claws. But here's my thought. Here's my thought. I'd like to get the spikes played this turn. So let's let's uh, spend a little freely. Oh, this is gone, by the way. So we can advance the chapter whenever we want. But the card warned us we were going to have to fight. Uh, probably not the best idea to do it while we're like already in the middle of our turn. So let's uh, advance at the start of the next round. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to gather some gold because I'm on the outpost. And then convert the spikes to count as green for the round and play them. So I've got my fifth heart out. I've got my, this is uh, the stun symbol, by the way. Some effects will let you stun enemies to show that they uh, can't activate this turn. can't like stop you from moving. I didn't say this, but if you try to move out of a space with an enemy, you take some automatic damage. But it's also used on some special cards for yourself to show that you've used its power for the turn instead of like having to tap it or flip it over or something. So yeah, with that gold conversion, let's go ahead and get the spikes out. I'm feeling good, everybody. I'm feeling very, very good. And all I have left is a swoop. I could discard it when I pass, but I'm kind of hoping I draw a bunch of red cards. And this, you know, boss that I know is coming out because I designed uh, the game <laughs> with Peter, so I know it's coming. But I'm kind of hoping I could just uh, go a little wild here. See, I'll pass. I'll keep my swoop. I wish I had another gold. Then I could prep this too by uh, converting it again. But no such luck. It's not exactly the hand I was hoping for. Although, you know, maybe, <laughs> I'm just thinking, maybe next turn I pick Hunt again. Because then I can use my Swooping Claws if it's prepped. I can gather a lot of gold, and gold will be uh, a little bit fun to play around with. So yeah, this seems okay. I'm not mad at this draw. All right, but we are almost down to our last event. 
The local warlords are collecting taxes. Ooh, uh, one gold on the fortress for us. I love all these free resources that popping up. A lot of these are negative, like giving you conditions, uh, negative cards in your deck. Uh, but we're getting pretty lucky there. Not getting lucky with our minion spawns, though. Sometimes in solo, you don't have to spawn a minion at all. Uh, we got a militia on the outpost. Come on, dude. I'm saying come on because, you know, I want to go and fight a boss in a second. And this guy just kind of popped up to see what happened to his friends. I'll tell you what happened to his, your friends. I might have eaten them. I, I'm... You know, I can neither confirm nor deny that the food that they dropped was actually their own bodies. <laughs> but I'm, I'm hungry for more. All right, and we are going to the next round. And let's not waste any time. We can at any time flip this card. I'll do it now that I have uh, all the cards in my hand ready to play. Speaking of uh, someone ready to play, you have gathered enough to survive, but your hunt has attracted unwanted attention. A large squad of warriors charges from the enemy stronghold, led by a powerful captain. You band together to defend yourselves. What choice do you have? So we do get more event cards as the chapters advance. You're going to buy yourself some more time so you can kind of like stay ahead of the curve. We're going to place the boss figure on the same tile. Oh, I forgot this. as the dragon nearest the fortress. Well, that is me because <laughs> I'm the only dragon around here. Yeah, so not only a militia, but also, again, prototype. These are not what the uh, <laughs> the meeples will actually look like. But yeah, we just got uh, we got some friends all around, don't we? All right, now we'll flip the card, see what this boss is about. We're fighting the guard captain. Bosses are a little bit different than your average minion. Let's uh, talk about how. So first of all, a lot of life, and it's based on players. So with uh, one dragon, that's uh, what this little symbol is. It's five times that, so five health in this case. Uh, with two players, it would have been ten. Additionally, their attack icon is different. This is a boss attack with the uh, cross swords. That means that they deal this one damage to every dragon in range, not just a single dragon, because usually, like, if you're fighting a single minion, like this militia, if we were both in the same space, we could pick which of us took the one damage. You get to divide it up among yourselves. No such luck with the guard captain. He's doing damage multiplied by the number of dragons. He also has zero to one range. And his boss phase, this is uh, going to be more impactful in uh, multiplayer games, but in solo, he's still a little bit nasty. Before attacking, the guard captain moves one to the tile in range of the most dragons possible. So he tries to hit as many of us as possible. Uh, if those tiles are tied, he prefers the tile with the most minions just to kind of annoy us as we try to chase after him. But all we got to do is deal five damage and we get to advance. We get to defeat him. That shouldn't be too bad, should it? Yeah, I'll tell you now, it's not going to be too bad because this is the <laughs> first chapter and we're not playing with any. There's a ton of ways to make the game harder. Uh, but yes, this is the basic difficulty <laughs> on the very first chapter. We got this guy, I think. Let's uh, let's have some fun. I'm gonna, I'm gonna seize to gather some gold from the outpost. And I will boost it with a stalk to get a damage. And I could try to fight the militia here, but I got life to spare with my uh, spikes. Let's just go for uh, the guard captain in his face. That's a boom. That's one. Let's not forget the gold I gathered. And you know what? Let's gather another one. And you know what two gold sounds like to me? Get out of here, Rome. We don't want you. Sounds like a swoop and bite. The old classic swoop and bite. Everyone likes that. So that's going to be uh, two damage. And sorry, in case that wasn't clear, I'm on an outpost, which gives me gold. I gathered two gold and I used both of them to convert these into attacks. So he's at three damage out of five. And come on, I, I think I have this. I, I calculated that I did. What am I forgetting? Oh, right, right, right. Swooping claws. I don't even need the boost to, gosh, I never didn't use this card very much today. I'll do another damage and I could move. I don't want, I'm happy where I am. That was my long dormant prep card, finally a coming into the fray, by the way. And oh man, I all I have left is a roam and no resources. If only there was some way to do one more damage. If only there was some way to spike the guard captain in the face. Oh, there is! <laughs> so there we go, we get one more damage. Remember, uh, cards in your life area you can use regardless of aspect. So we don't have to like use a gold to convert this. It's there, it's awesome. Let's get this guy. And that is it, a one turn kill. I mean, using every resource we had, every single card in our hand, except for that one blue card, everything we had upgraded into, things we had prepped earlier. We built up to it, but yeah, on the easiest difficulty in the first chapter, you're not gonna necessarily have the most challenging time. The enemy force is defeated. You are safe for the moment. You hope this lull lasts. You need time to scout your surroundings. You must find your family. So we get a reward section. Every single chapter, you unlock something new. And by the way, you can play all of the chapters as one-offs if you prefer. 
uh, especially once you've unlocked all the different difficulty options in the game. If you just want to like try chapter one with the hardest uh, modes and see if you can possibly survive, that's pretty fun. But first thing we're going to do is reset our player decks. Rulebook still being finalized. So page XX, what a fascinating page. Uh, resetting just means that we take out all of the cards that we grew into. I guess our dragons uh, weaken a little bit after their efforts. But also it's a balancing thing. <laughs> so you are just ridiculously overpowered going into the next chapter. But you do power up because at the end of some chapters, you're going to unlock some trait cards. Usually we draw equal to the number of players, but in a solo game, we'll draw two. All right, and here are two options. So these will permanently, for the rest of the campaign, the next seven chapters in this case, replace a basic card of my choice, although I do have to uh, keep the same aspect. So I'm going to replace, uh, if I pick Mimic, a green card in my deck with it. Or if I pick Thunderclap, I'll get rid of a blue card. So Thunderclap lets me gather with a blue. And no boosting, automatically, if it's the first card I play, I additionally get to move and stun somebody. Remember, that uh, means that they can't uh, hurt you if you run away from them. It means they don't get to activate their special powers, all that kind of stuff. So that's uh, pretty great. Or uh, for Mimic, it's a green card. I may discard the top card of my deck, and then I can play the top card of my discard pile, ignoring Aspect. So it's amazing if you can set up a really good card on the top of your discard pile, or you always have the luck of the draw if you just want to flip the top one. Hmm. You know, I might go for Thunderclap. I didn't really focus on blue cards this past chapter, so we can change things up a bit. But there you go. That is Flame in Fang in action. Again, the easiest chapter, solo play with no difficulty modifiers. Uh, there's about uh, four different ways you can increase the difficulty. So if you want it to be a huge challenge, you can make it so. And again, this could have played up to four players. Uh, we definitely want to support true solo play. We know how much everyone here, including us, loves solo games. But yeah, I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, feel free to leave some comments here, ask any questions you have. And please, uh, if you're interested at all, go check out the crowdfunding page. We would love your support. This is, again, the first time we have published a game ourselves. It is frightening. <laughs> it is stressful, but also so, so exciting. We love the game we've created here. We have other games we'd like to uh, bring to you as well if this one does well. So uh, go let us know what you think and check out Flame and Fang on Kickstarter right now. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good gaming, and I'll see you at the next stop.